You may be seated. Oh my goodness. I remember when, when Pastor Eric, you had dropped off that $20,000 at the conference. It was one of those things. He came down. He had tears in his eyes. He was weeping. It was one of those offerings you give. You kind of want to pull it back at the same time, you know? And uh, he's kind of like, Ugh, and, uh, but he gave that offering, and it just set the whole conference on fire. And ever since that moment, you have, I'm not kidding, pastors who have spent their whole life believing in others. They have sowed in other people's harvest while waiting for theirs. And that is not common. People don't do that. But your pastors do it because they're, they're the most remarkable people. And they preached our church probably 20 times or so. And um, every time it's over, we have to check them for steroids to make sure that was a legal sermon. We're like, drug test that guy. And him and Blake, they, they've always tested positive every time for Holy Ghost steroids, whatever it is. It's just like every time he preaches on Thursday, I'm like, I don't even want to preach on Sunday. I just rerun the video and say whatever he just said on Thursday, right? But I am so glad to be here. Turn your Bible to Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. I'm going to speak this morning on the subject of the beauty of hitting rock bottom. The beauty of hitting rock bottom. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. If you're not there, don't worry. You'll read it on the screens. I'm impatient. It's my personality. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Here it is right here, 12 words. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Six words. Draw a line. Six words. Draw a line. And he shall direct thy path. I think the problem is, is that most of the time we spend our life standing on the wrong side of the dream. Trying to direct our path when God is just simply saying, I'm just looking for someone to acknowledge me and stand on the right side of the dream where I will begin to direct your path. Father, bless this word for your glory. May people walk out of here and say, what a great God, and that only in Jesus' name, amen. When I was 20 years of age, I came to the city of L.A. to pastor a church. Well, I was supposed to only pastor for three months. There's a little old building in downtown L.A. That was, that was birthed out of the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. And they came to my father and said, can you save this building? The banks are going to take it over. We don't want it to belong to the big banks. Um, could you do something? And my dad was in the middle of his conference. He said, yes, I'll figure something out. He didn't know what that meant. He just didn't want the banks to own God's property. Amen? But then he, he, he came to me and said, son, I'm going to try to find a pastor to take over this church. And back then, in the 1980s, we were number one in the whole city of L.A. for, for gang violence. And my dad drove him around. He's like, uh, would you guys like to pastor a church in downtown? And, and uh, the pastors were like, yeah, we're excited. And then they turned around the corner, and they saw some of the gang members sitting on the steps. And every single one of them said, I don't feel led of the Holy Spirit to come and pastor this church. And my dad couldn't find a real pastor, so he asked me at 20 years of age, he said, son, just help me, help me pastor for three months, and then I'll find the real pastor. Just give me three months. I'll give you 10 of my best sermons. You can memorize them, and then you'll go home to Arizona. And you'll be done. It's been 29 years, and I'm still looking for the real pastor. <laughs> Maybe it's here. Would you take over my job? No. And, and, and back then, back then, I've prospered since, but back then, I was so skinny that when I stuck out my tongue, I looked like a zipper. And I was 20 years of age, but I looked like I was 12. I looked, looked like the kid from the Home Alone movie. And I, and I was just trying to pastor, and, 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 and most, most of my church um, at that time were all over 65 years of age, and, they were, and uh, so I inherited 18 people. And the first week I got there, um, the church was mad at me. I couldn't figure out why. In just like a few minutes, they were mad at me. And they said, we thought we voted for your father, and we got you. And I said, well, you've seen the father? You've seen the son? You know, I tried to. But they weren't buying it, right? And, uh, and so there it was, 18 people down to two. We were, we were having a revival in reverse, not like you guys. And it was, one night I looked out. At my church on a Sunday night, I came from a church of 10,000 people every week. And I'm a 20-year-old kid. I'm looking out, and not one person is showing up to my church. And I looked down the parking lot. I said, God, please send somebody in. A car pulled up, and I got so excited. that little, I looks like I'm going to preach tonight. And that family got out of the car, the father, and he was walking towards the church. I got my Bible. I was ready to go. And then they walked right past our church, and they went to the liquor store. 
So I just went right with them, you know, tough times, you know. And, uh, <laughs> don't worry, it gets weirder as the sermon goes on. But, um, and one night I just cried. I went home and I just wept for hours. And God spoke to me. He said, I want you to stop your crying. I want you to get up and I want you to go to Echo Park and take a prayer walk. Now, at that time, especially, and Echo Park was very dangerous. There were a lot, a lot of gang wars and violence that was going on, MS-13 and all the different gangs. They were coming. I thought God was mad at me. And he was just going to finish me off against somebody there who really could do the job. And God told me to do a prayer walk around the city. I walked for eight hours. I walked through Skid Row and saw thousands of homeless people in one open area. I walked through and I saw families trying to... Um, make their best living by piling into apartments and from different nations and countries that were trying to survive. And, I, and I, I walked to the park and I saw helicopters that were looking for young men that the police were resting up against police cars. And I, and I saw that night and God spoke to me. He said, the problem with you, young man, is you want to be a success so bad. He said, I want you to die to your dream of being a success. I don't want you to think about the word success ever again. I want you to die to your dream of being a success, and I want you to live to the dream of being a blessing. I said, what does that mean? He said, whatever I put in your hand, I want you to use it to help people. And I want you to serve with whatever I give you. I want you to love whatever I give you. I want you to think whatever I give you is the best thing in all the world. Don't want to be anywhere else except for in the moment of what you have in your hand and what you have to give. Love what you have on the way to where you're going. And I said, God, I have a desk. He said, move it on the sidewalk. So I moved my desk on the sidewalk, and I had my desk. I was the only staff member. I had the desk. I had the phone. I had three bags of food, and I had a candy jar. And I'd give to all the mamas in the neighborhood that are walking their kids to school. And then they'd be walking their kids to school, and they'd be like, hola, bueno, which means whitey in Spanish. <laughs> and I'd give away more like uh, candy and uh, little soccer balls. And, they'd walk by, and then they would walk by and say, hola, huerito, which means little whitey in Spanish. And... Uh, and all the families, and something began to happen. Someone donated a house, and so I started a rehab program. God spoke to me. He said, I want you to open up a rehab program because I gave you the house. I said, God, I don't even use drugs in my life. How in the world can I relate? God said, I haven't called you to be relevant. I've called you to be revolutionary. Open up a rehab house. And so two guys got saved from the streets, and I said, come live with me. They said, what's the program? I said, I have no idea. Just come to church and... Praise the Lord. Amen. And these guys came in the program, and, uh, and they live with me every single day. And sometimes we let the perfect plan get in the way of getting started, right? And I began to realize something. What God was doing is, is, is I was dreaming from a different place. I wasn't dreaming from success. I was dreaming from rock bottom. I was dreaming from brokenness. I was dreaming from a place that I was discovering dreams in me that I didn't know that I have. Sometimes your dream has got to go to rock bottom so that you can start dreaming from a different place and find things in you that you love that you didn't know that you love. Find things in you that only brokenness can reveal. And God began to show me that I had love for people on the streets. I had love and uh, through brokenness for, for people that had drug addictions and all these things. And, and before long, we filled the building. And, and at that time, um, our church went from 2 to 18, and we were growing. And then we went to 2 to 60, and 55 members of my 60 were, were from the buses on Skid Row. Now, I would go to church and preach. It was funny because there were 60 people in my church, 55 were homeless. I'd walk into the building and I'd have a sermon prepared and I'd be up there looking at the crowd and there'd be people like making out and I'd be preaching on faith. I, so I feel led to change my sermon. I'm preaching on moral purity right now, you know, and I'd be up there preaching on faith and like guys were fighting. I'm like, do not be angry. I just, I was freestyling long before Eminem ever was, you know. I'm just freestyle preaching. I wouldn't even have notes. I'd just go up there and look at the crowd and say, that's what I'm going to preach on today, right? And man, I mean, our church, uh, and then uh, some guys um, rode the bus, they got saved, and they gave their life to Christ. I said, I need some ushers. They said, you, th you think God would allow me to be an usher? I said, yes. And they started crying. They said, really? I said, yes. Why? I said, because you're all that I have. And, you know, and, 
And man, these guys were trying to get sober every week, and they were getting sober just because someone believed in them. They could have a job working in the house of the Lord. I mean, you know you got an outreach church. When your ushers are wearing ankle bracelet monitors, then you know you got an outreach church. I mean, you know you got an outreach church when the preacher says, can I get a witness? And everyone's ducking, you know. Just... It didn't make sense. And then all of a sudden, I, I was like living on Skid Row for several days as well and, and just wanted to know what it was like to, to understand the plight. And then, and then one day we outgrew that building. I'm driving down the Hollywood Freeway, 22 years of age, and I see a building on the Hollywood Freeway. 400,000 square feet. If you have it, you can show it. 400,000 square feet on the Hollywood Freeway. It was for sale for $16 million in 1994, and Paramount Studios was going to turn it into a movie set. I mean, they were filming everything. When, when I entered the building, Brad Pitt and George Clooney were filming a movie right there on set. And I saw that hospital. It said for sale. I pull over to the side, and I'm walking onto the set, and I see Brad Pitt and George Clooney filming a movie. And I went right up to Brad Pitt because I'm not intimidated by actors. I'm intimidated by your pastor, but I'm not intimidated by actors. I walk right up to Brad Pitt. I'm like, Brad Pitt, man, how you doing? He kind of like looked at me like, who is this guy bold enough to come up to talk to me? And I just went up to him. I started talking to him. He looked at me like, who is this crazy guy? And then, um, but back then, we used to be on TBN for 10 years, free of charge. They let us be on TBN uh, for 10 years where we all did, we just did street ministry show on TBN. We call it the hangover service. Uh, because at like midnight, people would come home and watch our show, and we'd be talking to vampires and prostitutes on TBN. <laughs> it was like, it was the nipping on the berries uh, show, you know, anyways. But, uh, and so we, we just, and, and, and so, you know, in buying the building, we looked at that place, and uh, I stopped, and I said, Brad Pitt, man, I love you. You're a great actor. I love your movies. He stopped. He looked at me. He said, wait a second. I think I know who you are. He said, are you that man every Friday night on that dream program on TBN? No, he didn't say that. I'm just messing with you. I'm just, <laughs> no, he, he actually took a cigarette and used my head as an ashtray. But it's another story. And, and I walked in and I said, I want to buy the building. How much is it? 22 years old. They said, do you have $16 million? I said, no, but I have a dream. They weren't impressed. They said, Paramount's going to buy it, and they're going to turn it into a movie set, and they wouldn't even allow me to get a tour of the building. You'll say, what did you do? Well, I found myself a back door when the security guard wasn't looking. And I looked to my left, I looked to the right, and so realized sometimes the Lord will give you a literal open door. Amen? <laughs> and I snuck into the building and gave myself a tour of the building anyways. How many here know when God gives you a dream, sometimes you just got to go gangster for Jesus, you know? And I'm walking through that building illegally <laughs> with one eye on Jesus and one eye on the security guard trying to arrest me. I'm like, Lord, give me a quick vision of what you want to do. And I walked through that 15-story tower, and God began to speak to me. He said, the pimps are working 24 hours a day. The adult film industry is preying on young kids who run away from home and promise them a place to live, sell them into trafficking. They're working 24 hours a day. The liquor stores are all open all hours of the night. If they can work 24 hours, I want to give you a building that will be open 24 hours, seven days a week, turning away nobody who is in need. And we went to the Catholic Church. We went above the business guys. We talked to the sisters. We said, look, we don't have $16 million. I mean, every movie has been filmed in our building. You can imagine Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween. I mean, we had to pray every single demon in hell out of that building when we bought it. We had the Ghostbuster Ministries going in there just praying over everything. And they said, go ahead and make us an offer. And we talked to the Catholic Church. We told them what we wanted to do. And, and I was talking to my dad, and we didn't, we didn't expect the meeting to go that good. Have you ever just kind of thrown out a Hail Mary just to see what happened? And sure enough, you know, touchdown, you know. And, uh, and uh, so we just, they said, make us an offer. I looked at my dad. We said $3.9 million. And they said, done. We'll accept it for 3.9 instead of Paramount's $16 million offer. And we were so excited. We were so excited. And then we realized, oh, my goodness, $3.9 million is a lot of money. We had $50,000 a year in our offering, making a bid on $3.9 million. 
We had 18 months to raise the money, and when we started the first six months, we had nothing raised, and we were getting letters and emails from people, and they were just sending us emails calling us reckless, calling us irresponsible, calling us a blight on the kingdom of God, and all these emails, and I'm reading them, and I'm not even getting mad at my haters. I'm actually agreeing with them. I'm like, you're absolutely right. What are we doing, you know? And, but I want to tell you something. When God gives you a dream, most people won't understand it. They won't get it. They don't know what's in your heart. They don't know what God's called you to do. Don't get mad at people that don't believe in your vision because the only one that matters is when God told you to do something, you hold it tight and you believe from the depths of your soul that it is from God and you waver nothing in it. And we started, and one guy came in town. He was from Arizona, my dad's church. He quit my dad's church because we went to L.A. He said, you don't want to go to L.A. He goes, they're the ones responsible for all of America's problems. And, boy, he had all kinds of hatred towards the city. And one day he was in town on business, a wealthy man. He came by on a tour. He said, I want to see what you're doing. And I said, I don't want you to see what we're doing because you're a negative guy and you're going to throw cold water on my dream. But then I ran out of excuses, and finally I had to just say yes. And so he showed up to the building. He was walking around, and, and uh, back then we only had like eight or ten people living in the building. We have 700 now who are homeless and, and in recovery and all that. But he had eight to ten people that were there, and they gave their little testimonies. And he walked through, and he said, well, thank you for showing me around. I want to meet you tonight at Denny's, which is absolutely hysterical that a millionaire wanted to meet us at Denny's on Hollywood Boulevard in the middle of the night. So we get to Denny's, and, uh, and, and he's just talking, and he, he said, Pastor, I want to apologize for what I did. I'm standing in the way of God's vision. Um, I told you this was not a good idea, but I really believe it's a good idea. I said, well, thank you. And then he said, no, Pastor, please hear me. Forgive me. God might take my life if I stand in the way of God's vision. I'm like, whoa, it's getting really heavy. He's like, seriously, well, I mean, I, I'm really nervous. And so he was just going crazy, and finally he just, he pulled out a check, and he wrote out a check, and his hand was trembling, and he wrote down the check, and he gave it to me, and he said, Pastor, would you please forgive me? Here's a check for $1 million. And I said, you are forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I'm throwing Denny's water, holy water, and everything on the brother. He said, I got a son. He's got as much money as I do. I said, tell him he's forgiven too. And uh, he gave a million dollars right there. Some guy from Malaysia shows up because God gave him a dream of a 24-hour church. He gave $500,000. And, and suddenly, I begin to realize that when you dream from rock bottom and you dream dreams that you never knew that you had, you might think you're in rock bottom. But can I tell you, you might be in the best place you've ever been in your life because you will never dream as pure. You'll never dream as sincere. You will never dream as wonderful as when you have nothing left and you only have one thing left, and that is to reach up and have the heart of of God. Some of you ought to give God praise that you're in rock bottom because you're about to dream dreams you've never had before. You're about to see things you've never seen before. That's your five-year plan, God in the way. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Stand on the right side of the dream. Your pros and cons don't have to add up for it to be God. When we bought that building, we wrote down on a napkin our pros and cons. And we wrote down all, the whole thing, why we should buy the building or not. The cons are we have no money. <laughs> the cons are half of our staff, staff members are ex-cons. And we went all the way down, all the cons. And then we had pros. We had nothing. Um, we're like, we have no really reason why to do this. But we had one phrase. It didn't add up. They didn't line up. But we had one phrase, and that is what if. What if God loves the people in Los Angeles enough to give us this building where we'll turn nobody away who is homeless? What if we can see revival? And uh, that's all we were running on is what if. But I'd rather run on God's what if and have one thing going for me than all the doubts that mean nothing when it comes to what God has put in your heart. Some of you are running on a what if today. What if we stayed in this thing? What if we didn't quit in our marriage? What if things could, I'm telling you, there's power and in, in going forward in what if. Create some miracle space. What's miracle space? It's a space between what you can do and what you can't do. But, but sometimes as Christians, you know, we get right up to our task. This is our task. 
This is our power. And we say, well, it must be God because I can do it. No, the secret of serving God is it creates a miracle space between what you can do and what you can't do. And that's where God comes in and that's where he gets the glory. What if? What if you kept on going when everyone said quit? During COVID, I mean, I thought the ministry was over uh, during COVID. I really did. Because when the, the, the lockdowns happened, we lost a million dollars overnight with all of our youth groups that come to serve for a week, that stay there for a year. Lost that income, lost all of our travel income and churches like this who are super generous. All that overnight was gone. And I told God, it's over. Have you ever told God that it was a good run, but it's over? You're like, God, it's been good, hasn't it, right? It's been a good run, trying to justify quitting. I'm like, God, it's over, right? And our God is so awesome that he will meet you sometimes at your crazy logic. He did it, Jeremiah. He did it to all the people quitting the ministry, Elijah. You know, it, he'll meet you at your rationale, even though it's not always perfect. or even close to perfect. or even 1% perfect. And he met me there at that place, and this is what he said. And God, God began to just meet me there, and he said, well, if you're going to quit, you might as well quit and go out the same way you started. You started serving with a desk on the sidewalk. Why don't you quit the ministry, your final two weeks, spend it with a desk and give away food to people in the community? And, and drink COVID and have a drive-through. People put their, um, open up their trunks and all that. I said, it's a good idea, God. I'm going to quit in two weeks, but at least I'm going to go out strong and helping people. And so I told our team, I said, do we have any food in the warehouse? And they said, yeah, we have enough for a couple days. And I said, okay, let's put it out there. And so I sent out a little Instagram message. Hey, we have food if you want to drive through. And um, this is right at the very beginning of the pandemic. And um, get some food. And so like five families showed up. And then people were at home and they were sending messages out to their friends. And then all of a sudden, it turned into a phenomenon. We were having 10,000 people a day in their cars that were showing up, popping their trunks. We were putting food in there. 380 days in a row, 5 million people were fed. And I was, and I was standing in the line. I'm like, God, remember, I'm going to retire. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But first feed those families over there, right? God has been playing that give me 24 more hours trick on me for the last 29 years. It's amazing what you can do when you've already decided that you're going to quit. It's amazing the life that you have after deciding that you want to quit. Because wanting to quit is a sign of success. It means that you have something in order to quit. And we're handing out food and like we had no money. I mean, we're, everything dried up. I mean, I just take my credit card and like max it out to make payroll. I mean, whatever we had to do, it was a tough time. But then all of a sudden, as we begin to serve, word got out. I get a phone call, no joking, one day, out of the blue, random. I get a, a phone call and they said, um, Kanye West wants to talk to you. I'm like, I've never met him before. I mean, he's got my mixed tape, but anyways, but no. <laughs> and so I, like, this is how random the whole thing became. I answer the phone. He's like, hey, uh, do you guys uh, uh, give away food in the name of Jesus? I said, yes. He goes, okay, I want to give you guys $50,000 if you're giving away food in the name of Jesus. I said, thank you. And I said, Jesus Cristo. You know, I came up with every name of Jesus I could, see if we can get another $50,000 out of it, you know. And he said, you're welcome. He goes, yeah, just, just give it away in the name of Jesus. And I said, you got it. And then I'm like, no, 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 wait till I get my money, right? Oh, they, they didn't do that in Lebanon. They will really do big things when we get our money right. Pat Robertson calls and says, I want to give you guys $250,000 out of the blue. Your church calls and just drops a huge, and, and I begin to realize that God loves the people that I'm serving more than I do. And he is obligated to, to defend the cause of the poor and hurting. He who gives to the Lord, uh, gives to the poor, gives to God, he will repay that which he has given. And God's obligated to respond and to help. And I, be, and I begin to realize that, that, that rock bottom was a beautiful place to dream. And millions of people are being fed out of rock bottom. And every time I go to a place of rock bottom, I decide to dream in rock bottom. Last month, we had 40 people sentenced to the Dream Center for one-year recovery versus 10 years in prison. It's happening every single day. The judge is pounding the gavel and saying, you're not going to prison. You're being sentenced from the house of the Lord. 40 people in one month sent to life, not to a death in prison, into a one-year recovery program. 
We have police officers dropping off young men and like in chains and saying, look, I don't want to put this guy in jail, but I really believe he'll do better here. And he's like walking the program like this. That wasn't in my five-year plan. That wasn't in my perfect dream. It was in a broken uh, uh, dream where everything fell apart, where God said, I got you exactly where I want you. Now I can dream the dreams that come from the purity of your heart. Now I can show you things about you that you never knew that you had. Now I can dream through you in ways that you never knew that you had. And show you love that you have that you never knew that you had. Some of you are about to dream from rock bottom. And boy, when they, when they kept saying that he's not finished with me yet, I'm like, that's exactly what I'm preaching about today. And, uh, and boy, we're just running around, jumping up and down, singing. Why? Because God rebuilds in rock bottom. There's a man living on the streets. And um, maybe you have his picture. It says Angels Institute. Not yet. I'll show you. If you have that one. There's a man that was living homeless under the streets of Skid Row, and he lived there for 18 years. 18 years. His favorite scripture was, I shall not be moved. Because this guy was famous for being homeless. He never left. In fact, people take pictures with him. He lived there for so long, and every day I'd get off the freeway, I would try to talk to him, but he didn't want anyone to talk to him. You know, and uh, I, I even offered him money. I said, look, I'll give you $10 if you listen to me for five minutes. He didn't even want that either. He just... Lived under the bridge, and, and uh, one day a girl comes in town on a youth group, and she said, Pastor, I heard that man, um, that, that, that his name is Barry, is homeless, and I want to find him, and I want to go get him under the bridge and bring him to the Dream Center. I said, well, you know, and I thought to myself, well, if God's man of power and faith hasn't been able to do it for 29 years, what makes you think that a teenager can come in here from out of state and do it? I was thinking that, but I didn't say it. Because my dad always taught me in ministry that when someone tells you something that you don't believe they can do, you don't squash, you don't squash their dream. You just smile and say, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> she said, I want to get that guy and bring him to the Dream Center. I'm like, well, praise the Lord. And she went under the bridge and said, sir, you're coming to the Dream Center to get a meal. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. She grabbed him by the hand and literally like dragged him into the food line. I said, how did you do this? She said, well, my youth pastor back home says that we ought to compel people to come into the house of the Lord. And that word compel in the Greek means to physically force them into the house of the Lord. <laughs> I'm like, you guys are going gangster for Jesus too in Oklahoma, crazy. And every day he'd get his food, he'd go under the bridge. He didn't want Bible study. He didn't want change. He didn't want, all he wanted was free stuff. Every day he got the free stuff and went back under the bridge. And I was getting mad. I'm like, God, this guy's just using us. He doesn't want to go to a Bible study. He won't let people pray for him. He's just using us. And this is what God spoke to me. He said, let him use you for all that you have. Just let him eat and take all the stuff, everything. Just let him use you. Because if you want to be a bridge of hope to the world, you've got to allow yourself to be walked on if you want to be a bridge. <laughs> And then God said, you told me as a kid that you wanted, you know, God to, to use you. I said, yes. You remember all the songs, if you could use anything, Lord, you can use me. You know, well, now I'm taking you up on the offer. And this guy got his food every day, went under the bridge, you know. And, but one day he came up to me and said, Pastor, I want to go into your rehab program. I'm like, praise the Lord, you know. And our rehab program is not like the ones in Malibu where they give you like whirlpools and pedicures and all that. I mean, our rehab program is beans and rice in Jesus Christ. It's one year long, free of charge. And this guy said, praise the Lord. So this guy came in the program. He was doing pretty good, 30 days. And I said, do you make it 30 days? Yes, he did. 90 days? Yes, he did. 180 days? Yes, he did. This guy, I don't know if you have his picture on there, but he graduated the one-year program, and homeless Barry who was living homeless under the bridge. You guys are good. I didn't, even, I didn't even cue you. Homeless Barry, who's living under the bridges of L.A., is now Pastor Barry. And he's on my staff, and he preaches 18 times a week to all the food chapels that we have. He hit rock bottom, but he had a dream in rock bottom. He was 18 years in rock bottom. But I'm going to tell you something. 18 years in rock bottom is still a place where God can cause you to dream. It's time some of you just simply say today, God, this is my moment. This is my chance. I'm going to bounce off of rock bottom, and I'm going to be recreated. God doesn't destroy people in rock bottom. He recreates them. I close with this. Sometimes I close five or six times in a sermon. 
But I promise you, this is it. First day I came to L.A., 20 years of age, scared of my shadow, terrified. I didn't know why I was there. I was just trying to help my dad, and I didn't really have a, a plan on being there very long. And the first service I got to in the midweek, there's a young man that was shot and killed in a drive-by shooting, and his body laid on the steps of our church. The ambulance was everywhere. I had to walk into the church building to give my first little Wednesday night speech to a handful, a handful of people that were there. And I walked past it, and I got to the Bible site, and God just, I was bothered by what I saw, and God spoke to me. He said, you need to cancel the Bible study and go across the street to that apartment that's next to, that's attached to the liquor store, and you just need to go in there and minister to the family. And so I told the church members that, I said, look, let's just cancel this, and let's just receive a little offering. Let's go across the street and just bless the mother, let her know we're help with the funeral and all this. And they said, young man, you don't understand. We're the church. We stay to stick to ourselves, and the gang members stick to themselves. I said, okay, we have our gang, and they have their gang. I said, let's just go over there, and let's just see what happens. And they were sweet. They were older. You know, most of them were all over 65 years of age, and, and, you know, they'd just been holding the fort down for a while, waiting for a pastor to take over. And that's, that's noble in itself. But I, and, and so I did what most preachers do when you can't get volunteers, receive an offering. When all else fails, receive an offering. And uh, they gave me $38. I went across the street to an apartment attached to a liquor store. I knocked on the door, and the door flung open, and I was staring in the face of the biggest gang member I'd ever seen in my life. He looked down at me, and then I looked up at him, and then I looked up at God and said, God, I've always heard there's a place called heaven. Save me a place, because I'm coming home real soon. He has so many tattoos that reflects his left bicep. The Old Testament came out, and the New Testament over here. He said, what do you want? I said, I'm just the new pastor in town. I just want to get some money to the mother and pray for her, and I will be out of here. And he looked at me, and uh, he said, all right, Padre, come on in. You'll say, did you correct him when he called you Padre? Nope. When you're that big, you can call me Padre, Rabbi, Bishop. You can call me Ray. You can call me Ray J. Whatever you want to call me. Just don't kill me. I walked in there $38, and I gave it to the mother who was, pray, who was crying, and I said, I just want you to know I'm the pastor. I'm here for you. We love you. We're going to help you with your funeral. I said a prayer, and she was so sweet. She said, oh, gracias, Padre. She's like, you know, squeezing my cheeks. I gave her the money. I'm out the door. I'm not like, have you ever heard of David Wilkerson, the street ministry in New York City? This was a guy that built a street ministry named David Wilkerson. He used to talk to gang members and say, if you chop me up, every piece of me will tell you that Jesus loves you. I'm giving the money. I'm out the door. I'm getting closer. And the hand grabbed me and spun me around. He said, Padre, I want you to do something before we leave. I said, Brother, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll rub your back. I'll rub your feet. Order you something next door. The... Just don't kill me. Don't, don't judge me. Thou must survive. Genesis 94, 15. <laughs> you're slow, but you're worth waiting on. But, but he said, uh, and so I just began to pray. I got out of Bible college. I left Bible college early, and I prayed a memorized Bible college prayer called Prayer of Need and Time of Comfort. It's like one of those memorized auto prayers that get you out of any situation. It's general enough to do that. And so I'm praying this flowery prayer. I'm dear Heavenly Father, we're all joining hands. I pray that you'll bless the birds and the trees and the flowers and the leaves on my knees right now. Pray, please, as they're shaking OG. Oh, I'm like, and right in the middle of my get out of there memorized prayer, the Lord spoke to me. He said, you will never get this opportunity ever again. Pray like you really mean it. These guys were gathering around. I said, Lord, I pray that peace will prevail in this neighborhood. Nothing happened. So I prayed a little bolder. I said, God, I pray these young men are not as strong as they think they are, but I, they need Jesus. And and in their weakness, Lord, you are making them strong. And right when I said those words, strong as they think they are, my right hand got squeezed next to me. I said, oh, God, he hates my prayer. I'm going down. <laughs> but I figured if you're going out, you might as well go out in a blaze of glory. I just said, Lord, and get their life right with God and save the neighborhood. I just started praying. And right in the middle of my prayer, I said, if you want to get saved, ha saved, have you ever prayed a prayer and you thought there's no chance it would happen and it actually worked? That's kind of what happened. I'm like, if you want to get saved, just a suggestion, uh, raise my hand in the air. And this guy raised a hand, and then the other guy raised his hand. And with my 1% faith, everyone was raising their hand. And I looked around, and I led him into a prayer to accept Jesus Christ. And from that day on, those guys became the, the foundation of building the church. They became like staff and pastors. It was the most amazing thing. 
I'd go across the street to that liquor store. I'd walk in the liquor store, and the guy would say, Hola, Padre, como estas, Padre? I said, I'm not a Padre, I'm the pastor. He said, you're the Padre. And the Padre gets all the free food and drinks that he wants. I said, you say free food, free drinks? <laughs> yes, I did. Bless you, my son, in the name of the Father. <laughs> and I, looking through some old photos of three-on-three -three basketball tournaments, the cheap Kmart weight in the dirt lot, thinking it was the greatest moment of our lives, and it was. Taking that little wall and letting guys do their art there and just all those moments of just buying those $3 little garment district cheap soccer balls just to give away to the kids in the community who come on by and, and being so happy every day to just to go to the store, find something to just build a relationship with people in the community. And it doesn't even line up with the vision that I had in Bible school. It was completely different. And it crashed and it fell. And I went to the most beautiful place. It was called Rock Bottom where all I had was brokenness to God. And God anointed me in that place of Rock Bottom. And he's about to do it for you as well. Every head bowed, every eye closed across this room today. And you'll say, Pastor, I'm just... I was just kind of taking on an adventure of what God can do with a surrendered heart. Your story will be unique into its own. And, but today, when I say three, I want to see the hands of everybody here in this room this morning who will say, Pastor, I want to be saved. I want to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm in rock bottom. But I am forever saved in this moment. This is the moment I would have never acknowledged if it wasn't for this moment. I say, Jesus, be the Lord and Savior of my life. Lord, save me in rock bottom. And not only is he going to do that, he is going to give you a purpose and a vision and show you things that the mountaintop could never reveal that was born in the valley. And all over this room today, you'll say, that's me. I'm in a place of rock bottom, but I want God to save me in rock bottom. I need Christ today. I want to be saved. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. Get ready. One, two, three. Lift them up all over this room. They're going up. Yes, 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 yes. Come on. You raise your hands. God is re restoring you in rock bottom. You're getting baptized today. Hands are going up everywhere. Just keep raising them all over this room. Lift them up. Yes, yes, yes. Just keep raising them. Yes. Praise God. Just lift them up all over this room. Yes. Rebuild me, God, in rock bottom. Hands are going up everywhere. Repeat these words after me together, loud and strong. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, that I will be saved. I repent of my sin, and I give you my life. You died for me. Now I live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.